So my love affair with Royal Enfield started when I, I was 17. I came back from boarding school and, I, and my father had this gleaming chrome red Royal Enfield motorcycle parked in the garage and I just saw it and I fell in love with it. That motorcycle became my real companion and that's the motorcycle I used to ride to college every day. And that's the motorcycle that, in a sense, formed my personality in a way. It, it complemented my personality, let's put it that way. Yeah, so that was really where my love affair with Royal Enfield started. My dad did encourage me at one point to do engineering, for example. And I'm like, oh, I don't like physics, I don't like all that shit. And I didn't when I was 14, 15, 16, that much. And then I did an economics degree in St. Stephen's College. When I was a bit of a loose end, I was 21 years old. Dad said, you know, you should do something. You finish your bachelor's degree, do something. So I started working with um, with an importer in the UK I, I, uh, of motorcycles and uh, you know I was just meddling around here. Then I went to Switzerland where we had a, an importer also of motorcycles but he was doing some amazing stuff with motorcycles. He was souping them up and doing some crazy stuff. So I became a mechanic in, in, his, in, his, in his shop and from then I got a taste of motorcycling. I went for a month long journey on a, on a Royal Enfield. You know, I borrowed the motorcycle from my UK importer. I, I had a couple of things tucked in in the back, including a tent, sleeping bag, a couple of other things like that. And I just went off, you know, I went off for a month and a bit, uh, meeting people, stopping at cafes, didn't know the language, half the place. I went to six, eight different countries. Free, exploring ride, where there's no end to the ride. When you get to that phase, when you're able to travel and ride without an end destination, without an end date, I didn't have an end date, I finished when I felt like. That's when I truly got the sense of the exploration bug really and, and, and riding for enjoyment. Like I said, my parents would never push me because they knew what happened if they pushed me. So then I spent what was it, nine months in Germany working in MAN which makes trucks. So then a year in Royal Enfield doing, you know, going to suppliers, seeing how they cast metal, how they do welding, how they do fabrication, all those processes, the metal part. And, I was taken in by that. I was like, oh my God, this looks really interesting. And I really wanted to know, how do you make all this happen? And that's when I got bit by the engineering bug, as it were. And then I, and I said, I want to study engineering. So I talked to people, I went to universities, I tried in the US and then in the UK, I found a couple of places which said, well, you know, you can do a postgraduate diploma in mechanical and aeronautical, which is like, oh my God, I was like, how the hell will I do it? Which is what I ended up doing at Cranfield University. So I started this degree knowing nothing and that motivated me so much. I was just like learning, I was a sponge, I was just getting, you know, learning so much and I didn't do well in my first term and then I really did well after that and I, then I did my master's degree in automotive engineering in Leeds, which is a very specialized course. It was never preordained in our family, in our group that I was going to one day come on and run this company, right? That was never the case. My father had left um, his position. Team at that time said, well, you know, Royal Enfield's doing really bad, we're going to sell it off. And that's when I came in and I, um, because I was like, you know, I don't want to pretty work in trucks and tractors. It was a bit dull. I thought motorcycles were much more fun and up my street. I was exceedingly naive when I went in. I was 27. I knew nothing about the world. I knew nothing about business. I'd done no finance. I had nothing, you know, I didn't know what working capital meant. So I really went into the deep end thinking, how tough can it be to just sell a few more motorcycles, right? It doesn't sound so tough. So I went in with that type of naivety. But when I went in and I saw the depths of the problems, I saw the, you know, it wasn't about selling a few more motorcycles. It was HR issues, it was finance issues, working capital, plants, you know, labor issues, all that kind of stuff. That was the deep end. And Again, that's when I really thrived, I think. That's when I really thrived, being thrown totally into the deep end and then having to work my way out of it. Six months into my CEO ship in Royal Enfield, there were, which was the most bizarre motley crew of senior management. It was three chaps who didn't know anything about motorcycles, well, the business, really running the business. But the most important thing was, it was a small group that looked out for each other, that made very quick decisions, and then what we did was we brought people up from, from the middle management. When I went and I talked to some chap and I said, buddy, 90% of the motorcycles that reach our dealerships 
have transit damage. There are two profiles of people in those days. One chap who says, sorry, there's just absolutely nothing that we can't, we can't afford anything, nothing can be done, sorry. Like, please, we don't need you anymore. Then there's a kind of guy who says, look, let's study the whole thing and we have to get rid of this. And then what we did was we studied, we understood, we said it takes some money, it doesn't matter. We changed from bhusa packing, we did, you know, proper, I don't know, styrofoam and nowadays. And we got fitment trucks which cost us money. But you know what, our overall cost, including our insurance cost, including the damage cost, including the warranty cost, the PDI cost, all those other costs that we weren't looking at that time, they came down, but actually our transportation cost went up a bit. So that's the kind of team we built, who was willing to look at things from a clean sheet of paper, start everything from scratch and with an absolute can-do spirit. So it happened very organically and we built the company in a very interesting, fun, organic way where, you know, you could tell if people are having fun and really enjoying themselves, then they're probably right for the job. I shed all of our debts. Today we have zero debt. We have 6,000 crores of cash on our balance sheet. That's because I'm actually financially exceedingly prudent or even conservative. Yes, when I first started working in Royal Enfield, I was on the road all the time. You know, it's one thing when you meet a customer like normally people meet customers. You, in truck business or tractor business, you sit down, you chat with them, you ask them stuff. Here, what I was doing was riding with customers. I was spending days and nights with them. So this is not about what do you think of my motorcycle, do you think I should do this, do you think? It's not like that. This is emotionally being with the customer. It's, it's understanding the um, the mindsets, it's understanding the priorities, it's understanding the emotional quotients. I remember the huge aha moment was when we set up our first, let's say, gorgeous store in, in Adia, which connects to Besanaga Beach. All the youngsters on the weekends, they ride down that road. It wasn't the center of town, but they ride down that road to go to the beach. So we said, they're going to see this store. I remember one moment where I saw these four, five young lads on these little 100cc bikes going to the beach and they're all sort of zipping by and we had these gorgeous Royal Enfield flags as well and these guys went by, I could see they stopped at the end, turned around, came back, they were chatting, they came up and they looked at the store and, and think about it, I mean it wasn't as gorgeous as the store but it was really nice, we walk into the store and they're chatting and I'm talking to them and they're like, this is Royal Enfield? I'm like, yeah. Like, we didn't know this was Royal Enfield. But I said, do you not know the bikes? I said, we know the bikes, but we didn't know this was Royal Enfield. Their perception of Royal Enfield changed when they saw the store. And when they came to the store and, and talked to people and understood the idea, and then we said, you know, why don't you take a ride? And they rode the bike. And, but earlier, their perception of Royal Enfield was different. The bike is the same. They said, nah, it's not for me, it's for my uncle, it's for my, you know, rural uncle perhaps. And that was the vibe in those days. And now he's like, no, this is for me. And he rode the bike and he's like, oh, this feels really good. So, you know, that was insight for me to become a, to become a consumer, retail-oriented company. And then we say, shit, let's put up really nice stores, right? So that's what we did in Sao Paulo, in Bangkok, in, <coughs> in Jakarta. We put up really nice stores like this one. And we said one store, beautiful store, let people come in, let people experience Royal Enfield. And if they love it, and if they really love it, and we do really well, then we'll put up a second store. At 2004, I've been running Royal Enfield for four years. We'd come out from, you know, deep losses and into a very interesting position. And the CEO at that time had seen what I'd done. And of course, it helps that I was part of the family. There's no question about it. Otherwise, they wouldn't be talking to a 30 year old or 31 year old that was at that time saying look you know maybe you should come in here so there's no question about that really in 2004 I came in in the group and I said look if you're taking me away from what I really love which is the motorcycle part bring me into the group then let me do or give me a free hand at doing what I like to do or what I think is important and I didn't think at that time fine tuning of some of the businesses was important we went 15 different businesses garments making shoes. We were doing export of food products. The point was we didn't need to be in all those businesses. So I did a portfolio rationalization. Eventually we shed 13 out of 15 of the businesses that we were in. 
then I could dedicate all my time and energy to the business that I love the most and that I thought I could make the biggest difference in and, and yeah, that brought me back to my core in motorcycles, yeah. When you spend a lot of time thinking about something, at some point, clarity emerges. And for me, in a very beautiful way, clarity emerged a while ago that less is more. I don't need to do everything. We don't need to do anything more than what we're doing. And that's a, at a very personal level. It's also at a, at a Royal Enfield level now that let's do one thing and let's do it exceptionally well. Let's not try and do too many things. Let's not try and go to too many places. Let's just do what we do. And if we can, if we can do something really well, it'll, it'll find its path. My inspiration doesn't come from you know, many people as such, or it doesn't come from, it comes normally from very small things, from the littlest details that I see in a habit, or the littlest sort of method that I see somebody operating in. But, but, but there are some people who, you know, who change your perspective on, on life and matters. And, and I knew this fellow, his name is Nick Sanders. He's this wild, intrepid traveler. I think he was the first person in the world to circumnavigate the world on a motorcycle. And that was a Royal Enfield. That's how he started his circumnavigation career, right? And I'm working in the factory in Madras and no, no cell phone. Or maybe there was cell phone, I can't remember now. 2003, yeah. So, he gives me a ring and he's like, uh, Sid, are you in office? And I'm like, uh, yeah, I'm at the factory, come on over. Uh, no, I said, where are you? He said, I'm in Chennai. I said, come on over, come on over. I mean, you know, we'll have a cup of tea and we used to have this lovely uh, Madras coffee. It is nice and strong and all of that. So we came and we we're having a coffee and I'm like, Nick, what are you doing in Chennai of all places? He's like, oh, I'm going on an around the world trip on this sports motorcycle. And I'm like, why are you doing that? You've just done a few earlier. He's like, I'm taking a group in a few months, so I'm doing a recce around the world for my trip which I'm doing in a few months, so that I, I'm like, are you serious? I'm like, where are you coming from now? He says, oh, I was, I was going up from top of the Himalayas, but I hadn't seen you in a while, so I thought I'll just do a little detour to Madras, okay, <laughs> and, and, and say hi to you, and he calls me the day he reaches, he doesn't call me in advance, he doesn't say, are you here? I may not have been there, if I was in Delhi, he would have sort of turned around and probably gone to Delhi the next day and see me there and then you know he had a cup of coffee with me and he's like cheers it was lovely meeting you and I'm on my way I'm like where he's like I'm going back to him and so he gets on his bike and he goes I rode with him for maybe 50 kilometers and then I'm like okay you carry on now but but I think that's the kind of people that's the kind of spirit that inspires me it's not big businessmen and it's not all that kind of stuff it's people who do stuff just because they that's they found what they like to do. They found their thing in life. So these are the kind of experiences that I've had which really lead me to believe that what we're doing here and what we're, the kind of stuff we're doing is encouraging people to go and write. It's not just to go and write more, it's to go and open your minds, to travel, to, to to see new things and not just physically but also in your minds to be to explore new avenues and 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 yeah that's uh, that's what also keeps me going that it's not I mean I'm not just doing this for myself uh, if millions of other people sort of do this then you know maybe they'll also enjoy it as much as I do.